Greetings, and uh, certainly a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Bob Lakeley and Robert for the wonderful introduction, members of the Canadian Executive Board and staff for having Syncrude here. And it's always great to be in front of you, and uh, certainly this year is no exception. Um, I do want to say that of the conferences that I've been coming to, and I think it's my fourth or fifth, you guys knocked this one out of the park. This is absolutely top drawer stuff, and congratulations. So uh, who is Syncrude? And uh, maybe, maybe not news to a lot of people in the room, but Syncrude is a joint venture of a number of various owners. Uh, Canadian Oil Sands Equity, Suncor, uh, previously Petro-Canada, Nexon Oil Sands, now CNOC, Murphy Oil, MoCal, Imperial Oil Resources, and Sinopec Oil Sands. That was previously the ConocoPhillips portion. This is our management committee, and uh, they provide us opportunities and direction to manage our operating capital costs on behalf of the joint venture and uh, direct our operations around budgets that are considering the, the overall cost of capital, the cost of operating expense, workforce, and certainly our production budget. Um, certainly with a board like this that we need to steward to, uh, as you can appreciate, uh, making decisions is uh, at times interesting. Twenty fourteen, uh, I don't know where the time goes. This is our fiftieth year as a corporation. Incorporated in 1964, and we started up in 1978. Uh, in fact, that was my first first time being at Syncrude in 1978. Uh, proud fact: daily stream capacity is 350,000 barrels a day, and we're pleased to be about 15 percent of Canada's crude oil requirements at present. And I dare say, on this journey that uh, we've been in, uh, members of the building trades have been with us from building and construction through sustaining capital, sustaining maintenance, and right through a turnaround that we have on the go uh, on the site today. So we thank you for that very much indeed. So Robert, somewhat like Toronto, we are the center of the universe. Um, As you are. Yes, we are. Maybe, maybe not in terms of the metropolitan uh, definition, but certainly we're the center of Canada's energy future. And uh, we, we don't take that lightly. Uh, we're here, we try and, and tell the story. Certainly, uh, I wish I could tell it like Rex Murphy did the other day, but would never be able to do that. Um, Fort McMurray itself is a, a very modern community. It's growing uh, between six to eight percent uh, year over year. And uh, that's, that in itself is something that's absolutely unprecedented in, in, in most regions of Canada. And uh, as you can appreciate, there's a lot of focus on the infrastructure that's necessary to, to allow people to uh, continue to come to Fort McMurray, build homes, have families, and become residents of the community. And that's that's one of Syncrude's strongest mandates right now. Um, you've heard of fly-in, fly-out uh, um, programs. Uh, that works well for a lot of people. Syncrude's mandate is to develop a local regional workforce where we have as many contractors and contractor employees living in the community and uh, being loyal for the long term. And what we're wanting to do is not promise them jobs, but what we want to do is promise them careers. And that's our focus. The Athabasca deposits the largest reservoir of crude bitumen in the world, and uh, it extends well outside the boundaries of Fort McMurray, but as you can see in the slide, it's into the Cold Lake and Peace River area as well, and certainly there's a lot of development that's taking place in those regions. Different than Fort McMurray, those are pro uh, most prominently around SAG-D operations, steam-assisted gravity drain. Um, and. Uh, the, the technology has changed considerably over that 50-year period that I talked about. We've transitioned from drag lines and bucket wheels to trucks and shovels, and now SAG-D operations. And uh, it's predicted in a few short years that the SAG-D operations will outpace 
the conventional truck and shovel mining operations in, in terms of production to increase our stream day capacities. Uh, Syncrude, however, will continue to be predominantly a, a mining operation based on the leases that we own and are presently operating. This slide is a little bit complicated and it serves nothing else to tell you that it is. It's a very complex integrated system that we have and it's a system that integrates mining, bitumen production, bitumen processing and utilities in terms of one integrated operation. Now building trades on our site work in every one of those areas and uh, the, the issue here now for us is after 50 years we have a lot of sustaining capital and replacement capital that we are spending and over the last three years although we didn't increase stream day production we spent about seven billion dollars in sustaining capital that uh, went to the building trades and building trades contractors to relocate our Mildred Lake mining operations, our Aurora Lake mining operations and some additions that we had to put into our utilities program. The focus for a lot of operations like Syncrude, Suncor, CNRL, Shell, is longer term operations are focusing uh, continually on sustaining capital. At times that doesn't expand stream day capacity or give us growth, but it gives us a safe and reliable operation and those are things that are necessary for a permit to operate. And uh, it's, it's an interesting thing. My staff and I were talking uh, going into uh, the turnaround. 2014 for Syncrude right now is a quiet time. And what quiet is for Syncrude, that only means we've got 4,000 building trades contractors on our site. Uh, last year at this point in time, we're upwards of 10,000. And, and those are the numbers that we handle on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and it works well. It works well because we've got great contractors, contractors of great supervision, Folks in this room really care about the operation that we have, your partners with us, and we can pull those kinds of numbers off and the logistics off uh, in fairly free form. We'll talk a little bit about that later. We have a bit of a hiccup in one of our systems that you're helping us with now. But folks, oil sands operations, whether you're at Syncrude Shell, Suncor, CNRL, Laracena, you know, the, the total operations coming up are all going to be very, very similar. They're highly integrated, great opportunity for good, great paying jobs, and you've got a line of sight into 30 and 50 years. So this is a great thing for Canada. This particular chart I'm going to spend a little bit of time on because I think it's great to educate people on what's coming. And at the same point in time, um, I'm hoping it comes across well. But if we look at the status column and we look at uh, that column under operating under construction approved application and so forth, it talks about what's happening in the region. And if we look at the operating line and we take that across to the right, we've got 15 operating projects right now that comprise 26 different phases. And a phase could be at Syncrude, it's Mildred Lake and Aurora, three phases of that operation. So that's how those numbers come together. And our stream day capacity right now in the oil sands basin is 1.7 million barrels. And that's about 60,000 person years in construction. Now if you look at what's under construction, we have 10 projects on the go. 10 phases, uh, stream day capacity about 480,000 barrels and considerable workforce with that. Now I'm gonna tell you, we're gonna go right to the total. Now if this total is wrong by 10 or 20%, maybe 30%, Maybe the cost of money makes some of these projects a little bit too costly to go give you that. So even if you take 30% off of that, the number of projects coming up are touted to be 91 with 147 phases. Our stream day capacity goes from 1.8 million barrels a day to 8 million barrels a day and 279,000 person years. Our future growth and this growth is, uh, is complementary of uh, uh, some research that the municipality of, municipality of Wood Buffalo provided to us. About six million barrels over the course of the next 15 years is growth potential. I'll remind you that it took 30 years for us to get one, to 
million barrels a day. And that's a 300% growth over the next 15 years. That's a lot of workforce hours. So kind of a bit of a pictorial form. There's three shots of Alberta. The one on the left is in 2000. You can see two blue dots. And uh, back in 2000, we were pretty confident. And uh, there's four major players, CNRL. Shell was in the, in the mix. Syncrude was in the mix. Suncor was in the mix. Life is pretty good. The community was robust. We didn't have bursting at the seams. We had highways who could navigate. We probably had camp capacity of maybe 16, 18,000. And, and then it changed. People discovered oil sands. People discovered that it was a safe commodity. It was in backyard Canada. Canada is a nice, quiet country. It wasn't in Nigeria. It wasn't in Syria. It wasn't in Libya. A lot of international organizations looked at the opportunities and started to acquire leases, and more importantly, started to build leases that they had applied for. So along comes 2012. You can see the growth that's in there. We've, we've gone from camps that uh, have grown to 80,000 capacity in the locale. It's not a bad little town if you put it all together. And that growth is still not enough. There's a lot of SAGD operations that are coming into place. That growth is going to continue to something at 2030, you see on the right-hand side of the page, that's just, that's just 15 years from now. That's uh, half of someone's career. And that's the 8 million barrels a day that we're looking at. And you can see that that's stretching well into the southern central portions of Alberta. This growth is going to continue. Uh, a lot of what goes south will be SAGD operations. And that are, they're, they're typically smaller operations, but they're very people-intensive. So that's coming at us. That's good news. So is this chart. What does it mean, OPEX and CAPEX? So operating expenditures are daily spending. Capital expenditures are what will give us growth and additional capacity. Over the next two decades, $500 billion in combined oil sands investments are projected for Wood Buffalo. $500 billion. Now, Operational expenditures, and, and this is where the GPC, uh, and, and Brett knows that this is coming because I've challenged him, oh, three or four times in the last three months. These GPC hours are something that are there for the building trades in terms of maintenance. Operational expenditures in oil sands are expected to grow from $7 billion today, that's on a yearly spend, to $23 billion a year in yearly spend in 2030. So if you can see the red bars, and there's not many of them, there's not many of them because construction will actually get finished. And you can see that we're at about $20 billion a year and tapering down over the next 10 years to something that becomes negligible. The green bars that ramp up, and you can see that they ramp up quite aggressively, ramp up from something that's about uh, 7.4 billion today, in excess of 20 billion per year, and approaching 25 billion per year. Those, those bars are sustaining maintenance, sustaining capital programs. And again, that's not negotiable, negotiable spending. We need to do that work. That work keeps our plants safe and reliable. That gives us return on investment back to our owners that they are expecting. And uh, that's the foreseeable future for maintenance in northeastern Alberta. Now, as as an oil sands owner and uh, an open site with affiliation with building trades, we want you to get as much of that work as you can because it's very self-serving for us. <laughs> you need to figure out how to get it because it's before you and it's before you quickly. So, means a little bit to Alberta and Canada. The economic impact of oil sands development to 2030 is about $1.9 trillion in Alberta alone. $1.9 trillion in Alberta. In Canada, it's $2.1 trillion, with about 905,000 jobs. That's a little city in northeastern Alberta in the oil sands basin that we showed you that little picture of. You, you, I don't know what... $2.1 trillion looks like. Fill this room. 
but I think it would fill this room or maybe fill the pit that we've got behind the truck and shovel operation. Now, the, the thing that's really important here too for our friends down south who are, who are very instrumental in, in assisting us, this is worth $521 billion to them and 465 million jobs. So the oil sands doesn't just necessarily confine itself to the borders of Alberta or Canada. It's international in scope and it's international in impact. Still good news, right? This is still all really good news, but then there's the reality. 21% of us, about one in every four or five in this room, are not going to be here through that period of time. We're going to retire. The, the numbers in the Atlantics are, are worse or better, depending on your perspective. More people are going to enjoy retirement. For us in Alberta, and certainly at Syncrude, it means that fewer people are going to want to come and work at our facility. If you look at the rest of the, uh, the provinces, um, they're, they're better or worse. Uh, Alberta typically is just a little bit below the average. But these numbers that we receive from Build Force Canada are really important because members of my team look at these statistics and develop workforce curves to try and figure out how we're going to get this work done with resources that are, that are limited. That's why, you know, Jamie and, and team with uh, Journeyman Incorporated, uh, you've got a prize, you've got to keep that going. Ross from uh, Ontario, what you, what you have on a go. These, these are programs that need to take hold in a much greater, greater fashion. Uh, the attrition that we have at 21% 20, loss, 22% loss, is not being made up on the front end at all. We're not doing a great job with apprentices, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, and we're not doing a great job with immigration, and uh, Minister Kinney understands that in, in, in spades, no question. Now, that's a bad news story and something we can do something about. Now to another really good news story around major projects. Don't expect you to read that, but every one of those yellow squares and yellow boxes talks of billions of dollars in investments in, in new capital construction, new technology, new opportunities for Canadians right across the piece. This is, again, build for stuff that we contribute at the National Owners Forum. Members of my organization contribute into this to try and help the data turn into information that we can use for forecasting and figuring out what we're going to do down the road. Probably one of the best problems that Canada has ever faced. Uh, this is where the work is, but remember the chart that I just put up previously. We're, we're going to have to do this with 21, 22 percent less people. And again, we haven't been doing a great job with apprenticeships. And again and again and again, it continues. Canadian population growth. Uh, the national population contribution is something, and it's kind of a morbid statistic. We have births and then we subtract deaths from that, and we get what's called the, the curve. The curve is the red line going down. The Canadian population is shrinking, and it's shrinking right across the piece, and it's shrinking in all categories, and certainly skilled professional building trades are, are no, no, no different. If you consider one on that left-hand uh, vertical uh, scale as being even in terms of trying to hold the, hold the case, hold uh, the sustaining numbers that we have. You can see that we're all over the map. And if you look at 2014 to 2017, we have to make up that difference in net immigration into Canada. And I don't know how well we are doing against that. Uh, however, I do know that a lot of the people that are coming into Canada are not necessarily people that will be uh, going to your union hall and signing up as a local professional skilled trade professional. So we, we have to understand what those numbers mean. Again, a great opportunity to build from, and it's not something that we're going to rec correct overnight. So that's kind of the story of Canada and what it means, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Syncrude, and you can see how some of this will relate. I'm pleased to say we maintain an open site labor strategy. We talk about that publicly. We're proud and really committed to the relationship that we have with the building trades and the building trades of Canada. No question, we wouldn't be in this business for 50 years if it wasn't for you folks. You, you guys, gals, and signatory contractors are involved in 
of all maintenance and construction that we have ever done on our site. Uh, the remaining 50% is dirt moving, reclamation, and, and those kinds of fringe activities, and uh, we have other contractors do that. It's over 250 million hours to date. So we did that over the course of 50 years. One site, over 250 million hours, consider 10, 12, 14, or 16 sites over the course of 30 years, and in terms of the investment hours that are available to you folks in the room. Just someone's got to figure that math out and, and understand what we're going to do to make this work. 2013, a uh, bit of a year in review. During 2013, we had in excess of 1,200 uh, professional skilled tradespeople just doing sustaining maintenance 24-7. They're there around the clock for us. That's in addition to our own workforce. Building trades, we needed about 3,500 members to do our snowy owl turnaround. And, and it came on us early, and we spent more time and more effort in bringing additional trades, simply because the work scope was, was that different. Our sustaining capital programs, now again, that's part of the $7 billion I was talking about. Sustaining capital doesn't give us growth. We don't get a return on investment for those dollars. This is just replacement in kind in our workplace. And it looks like construction hours, but it's a different bucket for money. Accountants need us to do it that way. The bottom line for us, that took 4,000 people over the course of the year. So if you do that math, that's 10,000 folks on one site. Um, Shell, CNRL, Suncorp, have similar kinds of programs, folks. That's why building trades and building trades contractors are that important to large industry. There's nobody else that can provide us these numbers of skilled trades when we need them, as quickly as we need them, and allow them to return home to their families and come back yet again. There's no other model like that that's out there. And, and I'm here to say that we're, we're appreciative of that, but it's, it's still not enough. We, we need more folks because of what's coming at us. 2014, well, I'm going to have to talk this one eventually. I talked about the turnaround that we've got on a go. Uh, I put together this chart on April the 30th. Uh, May 1st, it went to hell in a handbasket. Uh, Ursa Major, we name all of our turnarounds. It was going to be 2,250 people, and we've had another fluid coker that's come down. So we're going to add another 350 or some folks to that. That happened overnight. So dispatches have gone out. Our logistics are kind of messed up. So business agents and business managers, you may be getting calls saying, it's not ideal at Syncrude right now, and we understand it, and, and you're right. We're working really hard to fix that. In addition, our full-scale uh, tailings program is on the go. We've got 600 folks on that. Uh, that's brand new technology that it's going to allow us to use process water almost immediately and stock tails. And uh, I just get on a bit of a soapbox here. Um, Mr. Suzuki and others, uh, um, maybe some additional actors and actresses that have become environmentalists uh, overnight and specialists in understanding our technologies would have you believe that we're wasting water and we're not doing reclamation. Uh, it was interesting to see Sean and the, the Governing Board of Presidents look at all the reclamation that was on the go and the fact that we have process water ponds that we retain is a closed loop. It's not unlike a radiator system in, in your automobile. We lose a little bit of water to evaporation and leaks. We use leaks and we use fire hoses because we use water in refineries. Our makeup water is about 1.3 percent. So we're very good stewards of processes and programs. And, and uh, the FFT is that it's going to allow us to use our process water very, very quickly and put it back into the system. It's an investment in technology. Uh, our Mildred Lake, Mildred Lake Mine Relocation Project, we're relocating an entire mine. That's nearing completion. Our sustaining maintenance is about 1,450 people, simply because that's going up and we've got two major trains down. We're able to take the time to do maintenance and other activities, and that's going to consume people, and we're about 5,000 people on site right now. Straining at, at the seams. Now, switching gears a, a little bit, uh, Robert talked of Actums, and Actums is a, is a, a 
an organization that's paid such dividends to uh, owners in the building trades, and, and I know a lot of people in the audience may not necessarily know what it is or what it does, but it's a very progressive tripartite organization led by Mr. Shabir Hakim. And its sole purpose is to ensure that owners turnarounds and ongoing maintenance projects are fully staffed with qualified professional trades. And, and we, the way that works so well for us is that we work with boards of directors that are comprised of labor, and we have business managers that sit at those boards, and we have contractors that sit at those boards, and we do a lot of forecasting around the numbers that we need to get a lot of this work done. And when we saturate Alberta and we saturate Canada, uh, we're looking to the U.S. because we just need to continue to get these trades in. They, came in. they come in through your union locals and are essentially seamless to the contractors. And that's, it's an excellent program. And just to reiterate, we employ skilled, qualified, experienced professional trades from Alberta first, rest of Canada, the USA, and other countries. Now, these are temporary foreign workers, non-Canadians, if you wish. And I will proudly state that we do not manage a program outside of any of the rules of HRSTC, Canadian Border Services, or Immigration Canada, or your union locals. They are there making decisions with us. Your dispatchers know when you're out of spec, and that's what we do. So thank you for that. Just a quick synopsis, and I'm not here to blow Shabir's horn, but this is a program that works. The, uh, the membership in, not act, in, in Actums is not inclusive. It's open to anyone, and we, we do have some un other interested parties. It's a proven successful model that will continue to pay well. It's been accepted by provincial and federal governments, HRSDC, CIC and Canadian Border Services, Service Canada, Alberta Industry and Training, ABSA in Alberta, and other organizations that we partner with from time to time. We, we engage people in making good quality decisions that are the right things to do for Albertans and Canadians folks, so rest assured that we're not going to deviate from that. Engaging all parties has resulted in a better understanding of how working together makes for better decisions, buy-in, and ongoing support. We, we've traveled across Canada, We've been in Vancouver, we've been in the Atlantic provinces, we've met with a lot of your people at your locals to talk about our work. The shortages that we may be seeing, based on facts and data that we provide, a lot of this stuff is already now in the public domain. Um, the way we do this, it's normalized through Shabir's office, so if Shell, Sinkhood and Suncor are in a room, we don't know each other's information. Shabir's the only one that knows that. We have lawyers that are kind of interested that we do that way. And of course, that's, that's the right thing to do. You, the, this graph is, I think, going to be a little bit thought-provoking, and, and maybe it'll uh, help with education and, and something that you can put away for the future. Oil, sands, utilities, and pipeline sectors. Clearly, that's the only way we can do this business is with utilities, oil, sands, and pipelines taking our product to markets. The uh, vertical graph on the left talks of millions of hours. The top number, if you can see it, is 210 million hours. And that, the graphic on the right goes from 2013 to 2020. Those steps in that staircase are talking about 1.5 billion hours in construction that's before us folks. Uh, somehow you guys and gals need to figure out how you're gonna get some of that. Because if you can put in additional resources, it helps companies like mine have additional resources that we can put to work as well. But that's, that's a huge challenge, and that, those are real numbers. It's based on the numbers off the graphs earlier. And, and you know what? There may be some naysayers that say, listen, some of those projects are going to get shelved, and some of them will. Uh, Suncor had one that was called Voyager that went away. All we did with this graph is drop those numbers off. Hardly made a, hardly made a move. This is very real and it's before you and it's before Canadians. So if we, if we look at this, I'm just gonna pick on, on, on one bar and it's the one that's most obvious and that's the, the purple bar on the right hand side. What we've done is we've broken this work out into the specific trades around the work in construction only. 
and that purple bar happens to be a pipe fitter welder. That pipe fitter welder will occupy about 27% of the construction that we have on the go. That 27% of construction is 406 million hours to 2030. If we, ta we take one of the smaller ones in an oil sands opportunity, and, and I'm going to pick the cement mason, at, uh, and that's, if you're looking at the graph, it's the little green guy at the bottom, <laughs> uh, 1.04%. That's 15 million hours. That talks about the, the volume of hours that are before skilled trades and uh, signatory contractors if this work all goes to the building trades. This is on apprenticeable hours, and, and I told you I'd speak to this one a little bit. And uh, I will say that the building trades don't have this right either. Certainly owners like Syncud don't have it right, but we're, we're trying to do it. And what we have done, um, and we've had this on the go for a couple of years now, we have amended all the contracts that we have, and these are contracts go, that go to building trade signatory contractors. Those contracts have been amended to say that there will be apprentices that are dispatched to work on our site, and we've given them a range of 25 to 30 percent in terms of a ratio to journey persons. And that's with equal distribution between the first and final years. <clears throat> but we have found of itself that's not enough. Um, because we go back on a quarterly basis, the contractors report to us, and those that are doing well, we give a pat on the back. Those not doing so well, come and have a nice little meeting with Randy over a coffee. And we're taking this extremely seriously. This, this could be a, a non-conformance for the contractor, and if they're not signing up and they're not doing this, they lose the opportunity to, to con continue to do work on their site. That's how serious we're taking this. And when your dispatchers are dispatching to contractors on the Syncrude site, in your dispatch halls, through your business managers, there's a letter that's signed by myself and two of my VPs, one for projects and one for maintenance, principal users of building trades at Syncrude, that say we're going to enforce this. So we want you folks to be equal players in that dispatch process. You need to make it happen, and if it's not happening, and the folks on our site are preventing that from going on, we need to know that. We're committed to fixing that because of all the slides we talked about, there's not one that shows how, we're, how well we're doing on that uptake on the front end for that makeup, component, uh, that makeup component. And we have to do it differently. We've, we've, we've essentially failed for the last 15 years. Uh, if, if we were doing it right, we would have all kinds of folks in your, in your halls right now. And I'm told you've got all kinds of first and second year apprentices, and I absolutely believe that. Just their model is so backwards right now, it's going to take a while to fix that. So we can't do it without you, so let's sign up and, and make sure that that happens. So folks, I'm going to close. Um, hopefully, it's a little bit about Syncrude. It's a little bit about what's happening in Canada. It's a little bit about what we can all do to make the difference. And I just want to acknowledge uh, three groups who uh, are great friends of Syncrude and certainly great friends of, of people in the building trades again. The municip municipality of Wood Buffalo knows what we're signing up for and we're trying to get our city in tune for the work that's coming. That's a big job. Build Force Canada, Rosemary Sparks and, and company Appreciate all the work that you do, and we can't do it without you. And certainly, Mr. Hakeem and the model that he's created that is helping us continue to put Canadians to work. And when we can't get Canadians to work, then that's when we're bringing in some of your friends. So appreciate your time, and thanks very much.